Okay, well, <laughs> welcome everyone here to our wonderful conference, uh, Translating Experience, Medieval Encounters with Nature, Self and God. Um, we're happy to have you all and hopefully by the end of tomorrow we will all know what uh, medieval experience <coughs> looks like in all these three different realms and we're not just welcoming everyone here. Someone of you <laughs> live on Facebook and so like, hope that everything goes just fine. And uh, well, the rules of this live streaming thing on Facebook are that you can intervene as, you know, as much as you want, just posting things on Facebook, questions, reflections, and we will just read to the speaker. So it's this is you know, the, yes. the thing. That's right? the idea. So, yeah. so you will get your questions answered. Possibly. No, it's not our Unless fault. Unless running out of time. It, yeah, that, that, that's it. And if, of course, the question is a good one. Otherwise, <laughs> just pass through and you will never know. And we haven't had it yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. Okay, let's get started. Yeah, um, before starting, we would like to just, you know, what happened no? on Saturday night. Well, we, we thought that we should remember a bit what happened. And so... It's been another act of brutal, heartless and inhuman violence what happened in, on Saturday night in London. Inhuman violence against innocent population. It was London this time, it was Manchester's, uh, Manchester a few weeks ago and before that it was Paris, Nice, Baghdad, Manila. In a longer and longer list of countries and cities that had to deal with an attack against our most intimate values. This is a tough moment, these are horrible times in which it's far too easy to abandon rationality for something as basic as human, and human as fear, rage and revenge. For many of us, this is even more astonishing. We dedicated our lives to the study of how in the Middle Ages, learned Jews, Muslims and Christians were aimed by the same desire to discover the hidden truths of a universe and a God whom, while different, was coincident and universal in his love for the human beings. Often we hear that these are medieval times, but they are not. They are far worse than that. And while throughout Europe and the whole world there are too often too many people blaming that what is other and different, poor or in need, for what is happening, we should always remember that the unspoken source of violence is ignorance. Even better, Following the Latin etymology of this term, the unawareness of those who non yari sunt, who do not know. Indeed, they don't know. They don't know what is humanity. They don't know what is love, nor respect, tolerance, nor freedom. They don't know history, nor religion. They don't know themselves, nor their God. And walking in the dark, they hurt themselves more than they hurt us. And maybe we should even feel pity for them if the most human part of us didn't make us feel the outrage and the anger of all this. Before starting the conference thus, we would like to pay our tribute to the victims of this full, mad and unjustifiable violence. And let's do that with a minute of silence, please. I guess we can start the conference. Okay, again, welcome everyone. Um, when we think of the concept of experience, we would 
most likely not be thinking of the Middle Ages immediately. In fact, experience is so deeply connected with what started in the scientific revolution, the project that is circumscribed by the scientific revolution. Now, the two most prominent figures that probably every child in the street knows, if they know a bit of history at least, um, are Francis Bacon and Galileo Galilei, um, contemporaries, actually, at the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century. Now, I shall speak a bit about Francis Bacon in our kind of introductory warming up session here and say that he's clearly considered one of the fathers of the scientific revolution. With his works, Francis Bacon proposed nothing less than a full-blown reformation of all human knowing. So he said, his masterpiece that he wanted to write the great inspiration was supposed to become a replacement of Aristotelian science as a whole, but it was never concluded. The idea was that it consists of six books, six books like the six days of creation, indeed. The first on the partitions of the sciences, the second on the new method, or novum organon, the third on natural history, the fourth entitled The Ladder of the Intellect, the fifth, Anticipations of the Second Philosophy, and the sixth, finally, the Second Philosophy or Active Science. Now, Francis Bacon's Novum Organon, so the second book of this great inspiration, is probably the most famous work by him. Um, it is a philosophical work and it was published first in 1620. No surprise for medievalists, this work was meant to replace Aristotle's Organon and therefore do nothing less than replace the Aristotelian method. <clears throat> what Bacon had against this method is something that will hopefully become obvious in the following quotations that I brought with me today. Sorry about this. I'm Sorry, yeah. I have to... So, in aphorism 62, he says, and so the root of errors and false philosophies of three kinds, sophistic, empirical, and superstitious. So it's a division of um, false philosophy. And then he um, says that Aristotle is a sophist. The most obvious example of the first type is Aristotle, who spoils natural philosophy with his dialectic. He constructed the world of categories. He attributed to the human soul the noblest substance a genus based on words of second intention. He transformed the interaction of dense and rare, by which bodies occupy greater and smaller dimensions of spaces, into the unilluminating distinction between act and potentiality. He insisted that each individual body has a unique and specific motion, and if they participate in some other motion, that motion is due to a different reason. And he imposed innumerable other things on nature at his own whim. He was always more concerned with how one might explain oneself in replying and to giving some positive response in words than of the internal truth of things. And so here we might obviously ask, well, dear Bacon, what is this internal truth of things? And how do you think Aristotle would not get at it? And how do you think, do you actually get at it? In the second quotation, this becomes even more apparent that he criticizes Aristotle more deeply, this time on demonstrations. He says, bad demonstrations are the defenses and fortresses of the idols. <coughs> so what he does in the beginning of the Novum Organon is he um, talks about four idols, two of them being um, natural idols, two of them being acquired, so to speak, through nurture. The latter two can be gotten rid of more easily the former two are much more difficult to deal with. So these are the four idols he speaks of here. And then he says, and the demonstrations which we employ in the universal process, which lead from the senses and things to axioms and conclusions fail us and are incompetent. The process has four aspects and four faults. First, the impressions of the senses themselves are faulty, for the senses fail and deceive. There need to be substitutions for the failures and corrections for the errors. 
Secondly, notions are poorly abstracted from sense impressions and are indeterminate and confused, where they should be determinate and sharply defined. Thirdly, induction is poor if it reaches the principles of the sciences by simple enumeration, without making use of exclusions and dissolutions or proper analyses of nature. Finally, the method of discovery and proof, which first sets up the most general principles and then compares and tests the intermediate axioms by the general principles, is the mother of errors and the annihilation of all sciences. So here we can see that the two traditions from the Aristotelian corpus, if one will, the De Anima tradition as well as the posterior analytics tradition come together and are subject to full-blown criticism um, that all these, what, what's been said about this theoretically doesn't work for a variety of reasons on all different levels. And the last quotation that I brought with me just to contemplate a little further concerning the criticisms of the early modern thinkers, we read, but meanwhile, as we've said already, there's no hope except in the renewal of the sciences. So this is what Bacon wants to do. Namely, that they may be raised up in a sure order from experience and founded anew, which no one, we think, would affirm has yet been done or contemplated. The foundations of experience, since we absolutely must get down to this, have been non-existent or very weak, nor has a collection or story of particulars yet been sought or made, able or in any way adequate, either in number, kind or certainty, to inform the intellect. To the contrary, learned men, admittedly idle fellows and easygoing, have accepted in the formation and confirmation of their philosophy some reports, or rather rumours and whispers of experience, and have given them weight of legitimate testimony. Natural history contains nothing that has been reached in the proper ways, nothing verified, nothing counted, nothing weighed, nothing measured. But what is indefinite and vague in observation is deceiving and unreliable as information. And if this seems to anyone a strange thing to say in an unjustified complaint, since Aristotle, so great a man himself and supported by the resources of so great a king, achieved such an accurate history of animals and others with great diligence but less noise, have made many additions and others, again, have composed copious histories and narratives of plants and metals and fossils, he seems not to be paying proper attention and seeing what is at stake here. So the charge is he didn't look at nature or the light of nature, if you will. He might have turned his attention more to the light of the intellect. We will see. Well, if we pass to Galileo, well, we find a very close, similar situation regarding Aristotle. As you know, the dialogue concerning the two chief world system is Galileo's most famous work. The discussion between Simplicio and Salviati, with Sagredo as an impartial and even ingenuous witness, is one of the main loci where the account of the new scientific method is grounded upon its structural opposition to the scholastic approach, awkwardly represented by Simplicio. The tension between Aristotle's auctoritas and Galileo's sensate esperienze displays the author criticism and reductive perspective on the medieval notion of experience. So let's see, I have two, three uh, quotes from the dialogue. And the first one is Simplicio saying, Aristotle would not give assurance from his reasoning of more than was proper, despite his great genius. He held in his philosophizing that sensible experiments were to be preferred above any argument built by human ingenuity. And he said that those who would contradict the evidence of any sense deserve to be punished by the laws of that sense. Now, who is there so blind as not to see that earthy and watery parts, as heavy things, move naturally downwards, that is to say, toward the center of the universe, assigned by nature itself as the end and terminus of straight motion, the assum? Who does not likewise see fire and air move directly upwards toward the arc of the moon's orbit as the natural end of, the mo of motion, sursum? This being so obviously seen, and it being certain that Adam est ratio totius et partium, 
Why should he not call it a true and evident proposition that the natural motion of Earth is straight motion at medium and that of fire straight at medium? But one might ask, is experience in the Middle Ages as ingenuous as Simplicio states, positing the center of the universe as the center of the Earth for heavy things naturally go downwards? Again, again Simplicio. To tell the truth, I have not made such long and careful observations that I can qualify as an authority on the facts of this matter, but certainly I wish to do so, and then to see whether I can once more succeed in reconciling what experience presents to us with what Aristotle teaches, for obviously two truths cannot contradict one another. And again one might ask, was the medieval approach to Aristotle an experience characterized by such a reverence toward Aristotle as to treat his statements with the same epistemological value experience has. And then the third and last quotation. This is Sagredo and Simplicio talking. So Sagredo says, Doubtless it never will be in the minds of such opponents but what you say does not in the least diminish the absurdity of this peripatetics reply, who, as a counter to sensible experience, adduce no experiment or argument of Aristotle's, but just the authority of his bare ipse dixit. And then Simplicio replies, Aristotle acquired his great authority only because of the strength of his proofs and the profundity of his arguments, yet one must understand him and not merely understand him but have such thorough familiarity with his books that the most complete idea of them might be formed in such a manner that every saying of his is always before the mind. He did not write for the common people, nor was he obliged to treat this syllogism together by the trivial ordinary method. Rather, making use of the permuted method, he has sometimes put the proof of a proposition among texts that seem to deal with other things. Therefore, one must have a grasp of the whole grand scheme and be able to combine this passage with that, collecting together one text here and another very distant from, the, from it. There is no doubt that whoever has this skill will be able to draw from his book the illustration. And the last question. Did the medieval thinkers hold Aristotle in such a devotion that his ipse dixit was stronger and much more reliable than any sensible experience and observation of natural phenomena? These are the questions arising from well, these three quotations, and I guess are very similar, as you can see, in the questions Katya asked regarding Bacon's approach. And, well, these questions, hopefully, now will be answered during the conference. In part, hopefully. In part, at least, <laughs> <Yes>. of course. <laughs> we will begin to answer them. Um, but we've got an overarching question because there's a reason that we brought these quotations. These are early modern views, kind of going back on, to Aristotle and the medieval period. Um, but we've wondered whether Bacon and Galileo are actually right in their, in their evaluation of experience in Aristotle and, more broadly speaking, in the Middle Ages. I think there are at least two problems, two problems in their evaluation that we will genuinely encounter in our sessions, in this conference. And the first and greatest problem, I think, is the reductionism that they have. So they are talking about a particular kind of experience, experience that is limited to the empirical realm that is supposed to be observation and experiment. Um, and obviously, they find some flaws with what happened in the Middle Ages there. But the terms touch rivar nisayon, experientia experimentum, in the different medieval traditions obviously were much wider and concerned a much wider range of phenomena that could be experienced. <coughs> but even for the reduced part, we would like to ask, or the, for, for the reductionism, we would like to ask the question um, whether they actually make some false evaluations and observations about what happened in history. Um, and obviously the question of our conference will be, what exactly could these be? How have we, following their evaluations, possibly written our histories in a way that don't do justice to the medieval period? 
And so we would like to start here today um, with this conference to address these questions and to give a fuller, broader, more truthful picture of what actually happened in the Middle Ages with regard to the concept of experience. Before doing that, we would like, well, also, we should thank the IMEM, so the Institute of Medieval and Newly Modern Studies of the Durham Dar University, the Department of History, the Department of Theology, and also well, the Sociedad de Filosofía Medieval and the Sociedad Italiana per lo Studio del Pensiero Medievale for their support for the organization of this conference. So, thank you so much. Thank you. We're very happy to, well, for having had this. So let's begin. Let's start the conference. And, uh, well, oh. okay. yeah, let's start with Therese. Yes. Well, just maybe two minutes of pause.